Thank you, Valerie. Thank you for um, introducing us and uh, thank you the, the esteemed panelists. Um, it's so good to be in part uh, of this uh, very interesting, lively, and may I say more than timely and relevant subject. Uh, we have a very good panel um, uh, here today. And let me take a minute or two to very, very rapidly introduce uh, our panel and our guest speakers. Uh, Ms. Atsuko Toda, I'm sorry if I pronounced it incorrectly or with the wrong pronunciation, but Ms. Atsuko Toda has been uh, uh, over 20 years of experience with international institutions. Uh, currently, uh, she's working uh, uh, with the African Development Bank as Director of Agricultural Finance and Rural Bank, where recently she's also um, responsible for banks' investment in private sector agribusiness companies, mainstream disaster risk, risk finance, and development of special Afro-Industrian processing zones across the African region. Uh, she's also appointed uh, in 2021 as the acting vice president of agriculture, human and social development. She holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from Do Doshisha University, Japan, and a master's in public administration from International Christian University, Japan, and Diploma in Development Studies from Cambridge University, UK. So uh, thank you very much and welcome uh, Ms. Toda for joining us. Uh, the other guest is Mr. Doga Makiura, the CEO of Degas uh, Limited. Um, he's particularly working in this company in specifically in Ghana uh, and uh, working on this agri uh, business uh, enterprise to increase farm holders um, uh, you know, small, small, smallholder farmers' income in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, over 70% of working population, by the way, is employed in agricultural sector in the region. So the objective of Dega is to support inhabitants in the region by using machine learning algorithm, ego, provide high quality digitalization of farms and monitoring services of agriculture needs. He's also uh, led the highly innovative project Next Space, which is satellite-oriented data analysis platform for the African farms, co-developed with United Nations, uh, and many other projects across Indonesia and Philippines that um, uh, Mr. Makiura worked on. Um, Newspeak nominated him uh, under 40 Japanese innovator. So uh, very, very uh, good pleasure to have you here. Thank you for, for joining us here. And then we have um, Ms. Tatika uh, Katipe, the COO of uh, Degas, uh, working along with uh, uh, Mr. Doga on this company. Um, she's uh, have a, more than a decade of experience in consulting strategy and mergers and acquisition across ASEAN and uh, Middle East. Uh, former Delight consultant, she also worked alongside international and multinational firms, focusing on activities on developing and emerging markets. Uh, as a current CEO of Degas, she's taking into charge the lives of thousands of Ghanaian smallholder farmers uh, and leads with Doga Makiura about the ambitious goal of achieving a financing program for about half a million uh, farmers there. Um, she has established also Tribatika, a social enterprise blustering Southeast Asian fashion identity and focused on supporting vulnerable women in the region. So uh, again, welcome Ms. Katipe for uh, this forum, for this event. Thank you for having uh, for, for being here. And finally, and not last but not the least, uh, Mr. Aaron Akinosho is the editorial director of Comprendre Media, if I'm correct in pronouncing. He's a journalist uh, specialized in agriculture and agribusiness related aspects and issues in Africa. He's absolutely passionate about uh, major issues of the 21st century related to agriculture and food security, and that is probably the, the theme of the event. And um, um, he's a pure player dedicated to development issues in the African region. He's based out of Cotonou, Benin in West Africa. So again, thank you very much for joining uh, Mr. Aaron. A little bit about me, I'm a professor of international business and strategy at um, Lyon Business School in uh, France. I'm a native of Delhi, so I live between Delhi and France, uh, and uh, my area of research is uh, more on innovation at the bottom of the pyramid, development economics, and particularly what kind of innovations are creating economic, but more so social 
um, you know, impact on emerging and developing countries. Uh, so uh, I particularly am interested in microfinance, microinsurance. Uh, recently, I wrote an article about digital financial services in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm very fascinated by this topic. And more recently, I've worked on geopolitics in Asia and uh, how this is creating its own challenges, uh, you know, in the world we live in. And certainly, since we're talking about geopolitics, I mean, one of the big geopolitical event, if I put it as an understatement, is or the earthquake, if I can say, is the conflict in Ukraine. And uh, compounding with that is the the other C, which is the con which is the COVID pandemic. And may I dare add the third C, which is climate change. All these this trident of issues have created this notion of food insecurity and also this issue of um, greater resilience in supply chain, delivery, distribution, and transportation systems across uh, the world, not just Africa, but Africa because of its own issues and challenges that, of course, you will discuss, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Just small point, and then I leave it to, to you, and we can get into the discussion. Uh, I think I was reading a recent report by food agriculture organization that around 11.7% of the world population is facing food insecurity in 2021, which has gone up. And uh, the irony of is that the world produces food for 12 billion people, uh, you know, more than enough to feed the world uh, up, up to maybe more than 30% of the world population. Yet you have 11 or 12% of the world going under food insecurity or food challenges. So, let me get directly and dive into this uh, debate, and uh, maybe I bring Miss uh, Miss Atsuko Miss Atsuko here, and I'd like to ask you, you know, what do you think uh, are the current issues and challenges about food insecurity uh, linked and emanating out of you know uh, the pandemic, but of course also of the Ukraine conflict? Uh, your initial thoughts about that, and what do you think are the lessons uh, from that? Thank you so much, Dr. Mohit, and uh, I'm really grateful that you're facilitating this conversation, and thanks a lot. A quick shout out to Valerie for organizing this. Um, and, you know, what you said, the, the data around 12% foods of the population being food insecure, actually, on the African continent, that's even higher. So in Africa, we have a population of about 1.2 billion people. Of that, we're looking at numbers around 267 million, hovering around 250, a little over 250 million, which means that you have one in every four or five persons in Africa who is in the situation where they are food insecure. And as you mentioned, the food supply is sufficient for everybody to eat. So we're really looking at issues of affordability, of purchasing power, of low incomes when it comes to the African continent. An issue that we've been seeing and that we haven't been able to fix on the African continent is not that productivity is not increasing. It is increasing, but not as quickly as the population is increasing. So when you look at productivity, there's a, a slow slow incline, but when you look at population, it's actually exploding. Now, this sounds like a very um, somber picture, but it's not because Africa has a young population, number one. Number two, as you had mentioned, Dr. Mohi, there are IT, there's technologies that have been demonstrated and proven. Uh, number three, we see the emergence of a private sector in a way we have never seen before. Number four, we have a growing middle class. And actually, in the next five years, 50% of the population is going to be in urban areas. So as you can imagine, you have a clustered demand for affordable, accessible, and quick processed food. And right now, the African continent actually imports roughly about 75 um, billion worth of food, but this food actually can be substituted by produce on the continent. So we're looking at a number of emerging opportunities and really um, I see this as the greatest opportunity, African consumer markets uh, going forward for private sector. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Mohit. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, Mr. Doga, I, I'd like to turn to you because you've been working on the ground in the field, uh, probably also looking at um, as what Ms. Toda is talking about, you know, the, 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 the issues in Africa. What has been your experience and what do you think are the probably the human and social costs of the food in, insecurity emanating, of course, from the African context, but being further aggravated by uh, the pandemic and uh, and uh, and the, co uh, the the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, your your thoughts and what do you think are the major issues moving forward? Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Dr. Anand, and thank you for having me, Asian Society. So, um, as a company, Degas Limited, Degas Ghana Limited, we are a smallholder farmer financing company. Uh, we work with uh, about fifteen thousand smallholders farmers here in Ghana. I'm in one of the rural areas in Ghana, joining with one MBPS. So, um, apologies in advance um, if I basically uh, leave with a connection issue. Um, so the biggest issue that we faced when we started a business is the fact that uh, there is a lack of finance um, for farmers uh, to grab. So well, in other words, the access to finance. Uh, every smallholder farmer we have in Ghana alone has about five to seven million at least. And in sub-Saharan Africa, at least 400 million. And these farmers are eager to farm and basically increase their acreage to receive more incomes but they just can't have um, access to get enough access to finance. And especially when it comes to the finance in agriculture, as you know, it's mostly to do with uh, high quality agri inputs uh, such as seeds and fertilizers. Um, even prior to COVID outbreak, the fertilizer prices have been uh, increasing, uh, not just because uh, of the uh, high demand, but because of the a supply really not keeping up the pace. And then um, the COVID uh, hit, which really restricted our logistics. And this was exacerbated by the ongoing uh, Russia's invasion to Ukraine, which skyrocketed the fertilizer price to 100 to 200%, depending on where you're from. For example, if you're in Ghana, we uh, we have been importing 39% of fertilizer from Russia, which is now pretty much gone. So nearly half of the fertilizer imports gone, meaning obviously uh, the price uh, reflection is a lot higher than the world's average uh, reflection on fertilizer prices. And it's ironic that uh, some of the big companies in Africa, like Dangote, have recently opened a massive uh, uh, urea factory to help increase the production of fertilizer. But those fertilizers are uh, going to be sold in Europe uh, as a priority. So for some of the already vulnerable countries or smallholder farmers, we're just seeing increasingly more difficult situation to grab hands on fertilizers. So there is uh, two things we can only do. Uh, one is that we try to buy the same amount of fertilizer in bulk and have more negotiation power with these suppliers in the beginning of the value chain, which is something what we are doing. Uh, we are one of the largest supply, uh, one of the procurement uh, players of the fertilizer here in Ghana. And number two is to find some other ways to reduce the usage of fertilizer in general. So some of the uh, players, including us and uh, one of the um, very prestigious regenerative agriculture organizations called CNTA, funded by the Buffett organization, which is uh, based here in the second city of Ghana, Kumasi, uh, working with Neste. We're really trying to use uh, the lesser amount of fertilizer to keep up with the same yields that we used to have, which obviously reduces down the total amount of investment in fertilizer and keep up the yield. So these two things we need to tackle. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just the finance issue is already been apparent. And the international investors are kind of pulling away the money from the high risk, um, but a high opportunity, opportunistic market like here in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, therefore, we really need to uh, draw in significant attention back to the continent with economic benefits. At the same time, really do uh, things uh, we can be doing on the ground, which is uh, something we're doing. I mean, yeah, this is very interesting that you talk about because there are two aspects running around. One is, of course, the financing aspect. And then on the other hand is this uh, market forces of fertilizer and seeds and other 
ecosystem that is required. So uh, maybe I can repost this question to Tatika, you know, but is it partly also the issue of market failure? Uh, and also this again brings into the question of uh, aid versus trade issue, because I know Africa, recently Africa did a game changer becoming the, or trying to find or found the largest uh, free trade agreement in the world in terms of the number of countries, the African Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. Do you think such kind of policy changes of coming together of African Union on one side, but on the other side, these vagaries of geopolitics of war and COVID and climate change on the other side, and the third side, this issue of rising inflation and supply chain and the financing aspect. How do you how do you try to gel all these three together to give us a better picture about food insecurity in the wake of the African context? Yeah, um, I think it's a myriad of factors, especially for agri, we call ourselves agri-fintech, um, because we're not, um, as Daga said, we are not only focusing on agriculture. We believe agriculture is the start, uh, is where we could start to develop the, you know, the livelihoods of farmers. Um, as you said, like there are a myriad factors uh, conjugating um, that affect businesses like us and also the uh, smallholder farmers that we are working. But as to um, the free, uh, like as you said, like there are um, legislations or um, trade agreements. Yes, um, there are, we call this enabling environments and factors that, um, like you know, uh, first and foremost, attracted us to operate in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, yes, um, rising cost of, of fertilizers is not only um, because of of like the war in Ukraine, as we know. Um, uh, in Africa, like there are costs of importation, cost of, of, of legislation, uh, taxes, import uh, quotas, and even um, lately, um, some of our grains here in Ghana are temporarily banned to be exported outside the country to, um, to, to, uh, to maintain um, demand supply balance uh, according to the government. So, um, it's uh, we are working very well for businesses like us. It's a day to day um, uh, thriving and survival to 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 um, to work well with this factor. So um, like for as Doga said, uh, what we do is that in a micro level, in a grassroots level, is that also some of our factors um, would include um, changing the behaviors of farmers in terms of using fertilizers. And these are we cannot affect legislation. Um, governments are, are more powerful than us, but, um, but uh, private sectors like us, like from the grassroots would, um, would get the farmers to change their mindset from using chemical, uh, chemical fertilizers to um, hopefully use um, organic fertilizers, do regenerative agriculture, which is much cheaper, which is much um, uh, more efficient and preserves the biodiversity of soil in Africa. So one of the things that needs to, uh, I want to highlight is that there needs to be a shift or a much more extensive, um, uh, much more wider um, radical change of extension services here in Africa. And this is because um, farmers need to be um, aware that, you know, as you put more chemicals into the land, it destroys the biodiversity of the, of the soil. And when you, when you do regenerative agriculture and such to preserve the soil, this actually decreases the cost of production, like, you know, in, in such a way that could save the farmers, make their yields more productive at the same time, put more food in, in, the, in the generations to come. So, yeah, um, yeah, I think that legislation wise, there needs to be a, um, a uh, working together, uh, uh, some kind of, of, of like, you know, um, uh, uh, dialogue between the three forces that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. I think that is absolutely on spot is there. Um, let me um, ask Aaron, uh, you know, his views about the current state of affairs in the terms of food insecurity, because you've been working in this area on agribusiness. You know, what Doga and Tatike said also about is this regenerative and finance aspect. So 
Do you think what are the challenges and hindrances towards uh, development of, let's say, agri-tech ecosystem in Africa? You know, tech-oriented agricultural models, and uh, what are the main hindrances? Are they simply because of the logistics supply chain issues, or, or the financing issues, or simply the issue of technology? What is your um, idea on that? Uh, thank you, uh, Moritz. There's a combination of factor, as Datika has said it previously. First, what we must notice about food insecurity in Africa is that it's not only a production issue. There's a pro we produce food not in, enough to feed everyone, but we produce a lot of food. The fact is that there's this logistics issue to move the food from the field toward the market. There's some uh, post-harvest loss that we are, is one of the main issues that we are facing in Africa and that we don't uh, tackle, we don't address. And this issue is major because if we manage, because I don't remember the statistic, but it's almost basic, like half of the food that is produced is wasted in the field before reaching the market. That is one issue I think we should really uh, tackle. On the very specific aspect of the development of agri-tech, there's many combinations, there are many factors. The first one is the will. There's a lack of will to try. I'm talking on the behalf of Doga and Tatika here. There's some reluctance to try new things. And there's not really an ecosystem that's encouraged like the, the creation of a new method and adoption of its like there are many techniques just the drop by drop drop by drop uh technology for instance is being adopted right now it's an old technology but it's being adopted and we noticing on the field that there are even some reticence to adopt it so on this on the field of agri-tech there must be a boldness there is boldness from variety of actors from governments to encourage this for sure from entrepreneurs themselves, but even from the private sector, because there must be a market. If there's not a market, you can come with a solution, but it won't be adopted because at the end of the day, it's a, it's a business. So we must, that's what a very um, agri-tech issue. If we don't put boldness in this very specific aspect, we don't go. And I think that is an illustration of what we are witnessing in the field of agriculture in Africa right now. There's a lot of speech, there was a lot of, when you go to any meeting, they'll be that agriculture is the future of Africa and this and that. But when you come to the action, like the very basic action, you see that besides uh, exported commodity, which is cocoa and cotton and cashew, there's not that support. Actually, agriculture today lacks support, which explains why we are witnessing what we are witnessing right now. And to end up on the field of the food security, what we have right now is a model that is not sustainable, which is that we produce for other countries, we produce cocoa, we produce these commodities. We earn some, uh, some incomes of the quality. We earn like for, uh, for uh, foreign, what is the risk déjà? Yeah, foreign currency actually. We focus on earning foreign currency to now buy food to feed ourselves, which proves with the current crisis we are, fight, we are facing to be not that smart because if there's disruption in the logistic or if there's disruption, any kind of, any kind of disruption like the kind of we are witnessing right now, you are locked with a population that you can't feed. So I think that basically is the whole model that's need to be rethink, not only on the agri-tech, Issue, but even the the current model we are using is not a symbol. We are at the mercy of the next crisis that will come. But hopefully, we are resilient. But we can't always cut off that resilience because the combined shock of the COVID nineteen and the um, uh, Ukraine crisis will translate in more social issues that like riot, terrorism, and things like that. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's that's exactly what the issue is. You know, of course, one aspect that Aaron talked about is this whole journey from farm to folk, you know, from the farmland to your table. And there are many dynamics and challenges involved across many developing countries. 
and Africa is not uh, uh, new to it. It's the same problem in many Asian countries as well. Let me just uh, divert to another point to Atsuko, and uh, maybe if we have some questions coming up, we can take them, have some time uh, to deflect or reflect on those questions. Atsuko, we talked about all these issues. What do you think could be uh, the role of multilateral institutions, you know, like your company, like your organization, and what could be the policy pivots necessary, you know, to address these issues, not only presently in short term, but to create a more viable and sustainable solutions uh, in future and long term. What do you think could be uh, the required ingredients to do so? No, thank you very, very much. So as uh, multilateral financial institutions, the issue with which Doga mentioned access to finance is very important. And we are trying to finance some of the segments of the value chain that require financing. Of course, we have our limitations in terms of, you know, the, the size of target, um, the size of client that we can cater to, that's one. So we really have to work with an ecosystem of financial service providers, everything from supply chain finance, using different financial products like crop receipts, like uh, risk sharing facilities. There has to be ways to de-risk financing different segments of the agricultural value chain. And that's really, really important. Number two, um, as Aaron was mentioning, the infrastructure uh, in terms of being able to get logistics in place is, is extremely important. Um, and so obviously there will be a push towards getting better infrastructure on the continent. Um, in terms of the uh, policy enabling environment that multilateral financial institutions are working on, it is really about getting the private sector um, leveraged. Uh, when I was looking just at the financing that needs to be provided to agriculture for it to grow to the extent to feed the African population, we're looking at anything between 57 to 77 billion US dollars per annum. What that means is that every dollar that like donors or development finance institutions put in have to leverage government. Government is a key agent and government needs to leverage private sector. So that leveraging is, you know, about five times the amount. There is no way that donors, development finance institutions can play this role fully and completely. It is the players like uh, the private sector that we see. And I think it's really important that we have people like Doga Tatika who are actually on the ground in the field doing the day-to-day -to, -day to connect farmers to large off-takers. And I think that's absolutely critical. And that's why we need to find a way to also support early growth, fast growth, um, uh, you know, companies like theirs. And for that, it's really angel investing and there's other bits of, for, uh, that, of financing that can be made available. Thank you, Dr. Mohit. No, thank you very much. I think it's very interesting that what you talk about, the key issues of financing, infrastructure, logistics, uh, leveraging private sector. I think there's also a need for some sort of public-private partnerships. And I think the next way forward could also be as much as Africa and the rest of the world needs this kind of coupling and integrated of food supply chain globally, uh, there also needs to be some more focus on localized trade. You know, uh, I know because um, even in India, there are some foods which have gone off. Uh, people don't eat. They're mostly eating rice and wheat, while things like, you know, millet, which is a very popular rich source of food, is becoming like a, a kind of an endangered food species. So what about maybe this challenge of food insecurity can be turned into an opportunity to reinvent and relook and reflect on our existing cereals and food grains that are historically being you know, more sustainable, more localized and more enriching. And uh, that also comes to the point that, well, okay, we need this approach towards integrated supply chain, but at the same time, how do we decouple from that? I think I, I'd like to know a little bit on that maybe from, uh, uh, from uh, Doga, uh, what do you think? And is there any experience of yours as to what could be the way forward and uh, what could be the challenges and uh, opportunities in that area? Maybe Doga and Tatika, maybe you both of them can uh, give a small uh, you know, insight into that. 
Um, I want to highlight what you said about cereals and grains uh, in, in uh, being, to be technical about it, actually cereals and grains really um, uh, use a lot of uh, soil nutrients. Sorry. Uh, use a lot of soil nutrients in, in and this is being grown in, in, in Africa uh, quite a lot. And, um, and it also um, contributes to soil uh, degeneration in the country. So um, we, are, we are promoting uh, from the grassroots level, like for farmers to, uh, to do crop rotation. Um, I'm into regenerative agriculture, as you might, uh, cl um, cl climate smart agriculture. Um, there is a shift for that. Yes, there is actually, um, in, in the short term, we need, uh, there has been talks about access to finance um, for farmers and also to businesses like us. So we in Degas provides input uh, provision for farmers. That's the short term, like maybe in one to two years. But in the long term, I really believe that there should, there needs to be an overhaul of how uh, production in food should be done. And, but then all of this in the context of, as I said, like the, all the factors and the um, actors in the value chain coalescing into, um, into working seamlessly. So like, for example, access to finance in Africa, I was also working in South, South Asia uh, prior to here. It's high, it's the cost of capital is very high because um, the, the, the environment, the enabling environment, um, uh, ask for higher cost of capital. There's so much risk involved um, from transportation, from logistics, um, uh, importation, and legislation. So I really think that, um, like governments, especially governments, should provide an enabling environment for smallholder farmers and actors like agri businesses, agri fintechs to operate in the country, and that means. Um, uh, making the flow of capital easier into the countries, uh, developing emerging countries. So they would provide us like uh, concessionary debts and uh, capital. So we could expand easily. We could, um, we could um, uh, work with more smallholder farmers in the country as, I mean, I don't wanna um, uh, brag about it, but you know, private sectors like us are more efficient in utilizing our resources. And we don't have so much wastage compared to, you know, like five year projects, but we can utilize, we are, we are for profit. We are driven to make sure that the business is sustainable in 10 years time. So we could help the farmers or we could work with the smallholder farmers in the continent. So it's like a two way from the grassroots level and from a policy level, like they should enable us to thrive in the ecosystem so we could, we could be the machinery for change. We could be machinery for to ensure security in the next five to ten years, not in the first one to two years. It's a long, it's a long way, but yeah. For a long haul, yeah, you need yeah. a long haul. Doga, any comments on that or something to add on? Uh, uh, would you like to? Yeah, sorry, I, I think I missed the uh, previous three four minutes before Tatika started chat, but. Um, uh, similar to the question that somebody asked that it's not like I'm trying to be, I know everything, but in May, 2020, I wrote a Facebook post saying that the food production increase domestically needs to be increased and the food prices will keep on increasing. I, I predicted that two years ago. And then what's happening right now is as it is. I predicted that not because of COVID because in States, uh, places like Great Plains, which is a place where a third of the entire grains being produced in the world, uh, there is a clear dearth of water. There is no water underground. So there was no short term reason for any of the grain prices to go down. Therefore, the food prices, especially the grains, uh, would, would be just, you know, keep increasing. Um, therefore, uh, it's pretty obvious that we needed to increase uh, productivity and agriculture is something uh, it's interesting and difficult to tackle because um, Toga, can you hear us? I think there is some yeah. the farming methodologies. It's all about the post-harvest loss, uh, logistics, mm -hmm. the warehousing, uh, distribution from, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you can pass me. Um, 
Okay, I think um, there is some internet problem. Um, yeah, yeah, Doga, yeah. Can you hear us, Doga? Now just made some. Uh, yeah, go yeah. for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, there was some internet problem, but I think we got we got the point. That's and I think it's complementary to what Satika said. Um, I, I think what I'll do is that maybe I'll take one or two questions and then we move on further with the discussion. I like these two questions particularly. One by Michael. Uh, in times of war and pandemic, can food aid be considered as a strategic weapon used to effectively support a country? Uh, and if I may add one more question, quite similar to it, is that what are the ways to connect foreign investment or angel investing, is what Tatika and you talked about, in terms of agri-fintech or financing uh, in the African market uh, that are invested directly to local solutions? And how has the conflict in Ukraine showed us as to how a war away from Africa or away from us can affect everybody's livelihood in terms of supply chain and food security or food chain. Uh, any one of that, maybe Aaron, you can uh, you can start with that or your thoughts on that? Yes, yes I think the, the question are, are quite interesting. Uh, can food be used as strategic weapon? Clearly, yes, that's what Russia is currently doing. That's what we're witnessing because right now what is happening is that the all the grain of UK of Ukraine can be exported to add um, their their markets and mainly in Africa. We have to remind people that when it comes to wheat, Russia and Ukraine made 40% of the world production. And uh, areas like North Africa are mainly a heavily dependent of these imports. So if those food, if those wheat don't come out, there's clearly a threat. Yes, uh, food can be used as a strategic weapon, and this is what we are witnessing uh, right now. How can a conflict that is happening away from us can affect our food? This is a question I heard a lot in Africa, but it's happened because we are in this thing called globalization, you see, and all the economics are interconnected. For instance, not only on the wheat side, but on the urea side, when it's come to fertilizer, Russia, is a major player and countries like my country for instance manage to get supply in fertilizer from russia but let's remember that russia right now is under sanction so if they can't move their fertilizer out of the country toward us what we end up with no fertilizer at the very end of the day and there's another issue because and doga has noticed it uh, some countries like Nigeria and Morocco, and Morocco, for instance, has been for a long time a major player in the field of fertilizer. But Nigeria, which is closer to us in West Africa, is a new one with the Dangote uh, infrastructure. But the fact is that if even those countries that produce from Africa uh, focus on exporting because it makes them more money, we are at the mercy of the market. It is what's happening uh, right now. This is what we are witnessing. The fact is that basically we can run out of fertilizer at short term. We can run out, not run out, but we are at risk with the wheat because wheat is made for bread and bread is the, is the main source, one of the main source of calories even here in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we can run out of bread. Of course, they have they that have, they have, some alternative like uh, Fonio, like Sorgo, but those alternatives are not yet developed. And what is asked us as African as a question is, how do we do to manage to assure a minimum of food security? Because we can be at the mercy of events like that. And I think that one of the solution is first, we should focus less on commodities, of, on export commodities, and much more on usual food products like maize and like uh, cassava that come into the diets of the of the ordinary folks. We should focus more on producing this, at least in surface or uh, insufficient quantity, so that if even there's a crisis, we have a buffer. And this depend on this is a question uh, of policy. Because what we are doing right now in agriculture is favorizing uh, those export commodities, but not the basic food we'll eat on 
every day. So I think I'll stop that and left the question of the risk of investing from of business angel to the to the local supply chain to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. I think absolutely. This is what you mentioned is so critical. Um, Atsuko, maybe I can take a liberty of asking you a question that one of our um, audience member has asked is that, can you explain further the issue? Um, I know in the times of war, uh, no, sorry, this is, we have already talked about. So there's so many questions that I'm trying to look, which could be interesting. Uh, there is one uh, uh, that uh, is asked, which is very particular about fertilizers. So, I mean, either you or any of our panel can talk about it. It's by Lukman Al-Hassan. How would you convince farmers to use fertilizers when I know perfectly that there are farmers and even consumers who do not want to buy food stuff that's been cultivated with fertilizer? Well, that's, again, a tricky question because uh, now a lot of consumers are becoming... So there are two issues, I think. One is the food insecurity, and the other is about uh, the insecurity or the, the, the need for food nutrition. Uh, so I think that's there. But at the same time, there's this notion of sustainable development and of food and moving away from fertilizers, organic, bio. It's a big thing in Europe, by the way. But then again, the, it's a it's a catch-22 situation, which is about affordability and scalability. Uh, so what, what are your thoughts, Atsuka? And maybe Tatika, you can follow it up after. Yeah, I'm going to actually ask Tatika to answer this question because I think this is really their ducket and then uh, I'd love to come in uh, further. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so uh, we, I mean, we are actually at the nexus of this fertilizers versus organic fertilizers. And I want to bring into spotlight like how the Sri Lanka uh, did this in yeah. uh, last year. So the president, I mean, the former, um, you know, uh, president of uh, prime minister of Sri Lanka uh, issued a decree that, you know, um, all the chemical fertilizers will be banned from the country and everyone has to use organic fertilizers. And, and we know the results. So the country is in chaos and, you know, the, when all know the president. So um, for me, um, there is no clear uh, way in, in really like, okay, tomorrow, let's use organic fertilizers. It, it will not happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like from a policy perspective, that, that was, uh, sorry, a mistake. Because uh, changing the mindset of farmers and yes, the, the consumers are more, um, I say like, you know, um, aware of how fertilizers are, you know, um, about soil nutrition and, and, and the effects on, on the, we call it land productivity. But for farmers, it takes more than that. And I've mentioned, because there is some cultural um, uh, context to that, you know, for the past years, not only in Africa, but also in Asia, um, we've, we've piloted projects that uses, um, you know, organic fertilizers. In some cases, there is a market for organic fertilizers. You can get it from Europe. But um, based on my experience, organic fertilizers that are highly commercial are more expensive than chemical fertilizers. Those who have been uh, 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 produced in Europe, plus logistics. So there is a way of doing climate smart agriculture, which you can do like, you know, using more foliar, fertili uh, foliar fertilizers. But to change the minds of the farmers, it takes time. One of the things that I've mentioned earlier is extensive agricultural services to convince the farmers to that organic fertilizer, cheaper organic fertilizer is, uh, is more effective, produce uh, better yield, healthy, uh, that will make your land healthier and will make the land sustainable. So this could... Uh, this is done by demo uh, demo farms, um, work of legislation, like you know, like governments coalescing together and private sectors, maybe um, uh, bilateral uh, organizations. Like uh, this is, but but you have to start from the grassroots level. It will they will mm -hmm. maybe the market forces uh, from Europe. Like okay, we need more organic, uh, produce sustainable uh, production, and apart. Uh, Currently for us, we have um, off takers like Nestle who would get us like they have ambitious goals of like 2020, uh, 2025, like uh, carbon zero footprint. And they force like uh, players like us to to do climate smart agriculture. So yeah. I think we're getting there. But to convince it from a grassroots level, we need the help of extensive uh, agricultural extension services um, in the country. Yeah. But we will not do it in the next two or three years. 
but maybe in the next five or 10 years, if we uh, work together. Um, Atsuko, if you can add. Okay, yeah. interesting, uh, very interesting. Uh, Doga, would you like to give your insights on that? And uh, maybe what I can also do is add another question to you, Doga, and maybe Aaron can also uh, talk about it. Um, this is a much more uh, multi-layered question, which is basically can be divided into two parts. So one of the one of the audience member asks, that, "What are the issues that you don't necessarily anticipate in these crises, and what do you think was going to be the obstacle or to be an obstacle and turned out to be something else?" And I think if I may add on that question, is that probably um, what is what is the takeaway from this? Uh, this upheaval at the pandemic or uh, Ukraine conflict and probably also climate change. And of course, we also discussed the own problems in Africa in terms of its developing its agricultural e ecosystem uh, brings along. So what are the learnings? What are the takeaways? And in short, maybe where do we go from here? I think it's a question that maybe I can ask all of you in a very small, brief uh, um, uh, idea that you'd like to share with us. Starting yeah. with Aaron, maybe. Or, or Doga, Doga, please go ahead, and then yeah. maybe Aaron. Um, yeah. So the worst thing about the war, Ukraine-Russia war, is that <laughs> these two countries not just produced uh, one of the largest amounts of grains, but also the fertilizers. Uh, so the price uh, of the food prices going, you know, increasing was within our anticipation. However, we didn't expect the fertilizer prices to also go up, which doesn't always reflect the increase in food prices. Uh, so um, that's the uh, important thing. But the, in short term, we really have to increase the amount of usage and distribution of fertilizers because it's all about the question of whether you want to go hunger and die or choose organic fertilizer or organic food and to eat less, right? Uh, but in mid to long term, as Tatika mentioned, we have to really be opening our doors to use more organic fertilizer or um, use more on the regenerative agriculture for the, by understanding the soil profiles. Um, and these things, uh, the fertilizer issue is something uh, that we didn't expect. So we really have to invest a lot of money in it. But uh, going back to the question, the thing that we, you know, we really must understand is that uh, we cannot just save this continent with just uh, aid in general. There has to be economic benefits as long as we're living in a capitalistic world. For example, uh, speaking of the climate smart agriculture, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has the cheapest cost of doing carbon sequestration to absorb CO2 after Latin America. So there is a benefit for companies from developed countries to invest money to buy and create carbon credits in Sub-Saharan Africa so that they can actually save cost and get ready for the TCFD and CDP and all these organizations that every single massive uh, public company have to take care of. So there is an economic uh, benefit and rationale uh, for these companies to invest in Africa. So we have to look at from the short term and long term perspective, uh, but also uh, the economic benefit, as well as the fact that we have to do something in short term to solve this food crisis. Thank you. Okay. Very interesting. Aaron, your take, please. Yes, uh, the main lesson we must learn from this as Africans is that we can't always rely on people or someone else to do something basic as feeding us. It doesn't work. The current model, which is based on producing export commodity uh, at the detriment of our own food produ production is detrimental and it will lead to more crises because one of the main impacts of this crisis that we are not seeing is this. Right now, we are witnessing real violence and terrorism. Even in country like my country, which is has been for a long time a peaceful country, we are not witnessing right now a surge in terrorism. But what terrorism is? Terrorism is just a combination of hunger and unemployment, which means what? If we don't do good politics, the we'll have the pay, the, the payback is will be immediate. Right now, we don't have any time, any more time to like. Like, like, coming and like going, like, we can delay some choice right now. We have to start feeding our own population, which requires political courage, yes, for sure, which requires good business environment. Because at the end of the day, is business. If I put money in a business, I'm expecting a benefit from it. Right now, 
what this crisis is teaching us is that we can't just say uh, stay aside and act like if what's happening to others doesn't concern us. It concerns us more than anyone on the level of climate change, on the level of the COVID-19, because what is funny with COVID-19, for instance, is that on the, on the health issue, on the health level, we didn't witness that amount of death and stuff like that. But on the employment level, on the economical level, on the like day-to-day -day living level, we are the continent that has paid the, the most, the more important tributes to the disease. And we are the continent that is being more affected by the crisis in Ukraine. And the lesson is that it's time to start to put our world, to put action behind our world. Even if we do what we say we will do in 2003 at Maputo, like committing 10% of the GDP of our country to agriculture, we will have been safer by now. On the short term, I think that we'll require, we'll go to the, a lot of aid, a lot of uh, IMF, financing and stuff like that, because we have no room to mitigate this. But once this crisis will be behind us, we should remember that we can't go on the way we are going on right now. For me, this is the main lesson for, of this. I think, yeah, this is very interesting. I think uh, taking a cue from your last point about, you know, if I can rephrase it as uh, government and policy makers and regulators have to walk the talk, you know, uh, that you talked about. And I think um, there's one question which I found very interesting from uh, Isofu Autara. She's the chairman of Zanzan Region Chamber of Commerce. She asks, or he asks, how can we, and maybe, um, uh, Ms. Toda, you can talk, uh, take this question. How can we better connect development banks to what is seen as high-risk activities such as agriculture? Agriculture is underinvested by many regional uh, uh, countries in Africa, while private investment, as Doga mentioned, is reluctant. What can be concretely done about that? And if I may add one point from my side, I mean, what could be the role of um, multilateral institutions like IMF or uh, others and probably developed countries, you know, uh, is it just limited to aid or probably enabling them uh, in terms of uh, technology transfer and empowerment, reduction of tariffs? This is a big debate in Africa because of the huge subsidies and uh, this is a big debate in Europe because of huge subsidies in uh, the, the common agriculture policy that Europe has. So what is your take on that? Uh, thank you so very much. And um, I think it's important not to waste a crisis. Uh, in 2008, prices of food went up exponentially and afterwards the development community came together to be able to mobilize a lot of financing for food security. And today we're facing an even larger crisis than we're facing in two, faced in 2008. So really, I think it's up to the heads of international development agencies, heads of states, uh, governments in Africa to really get the word out there that food security is absolutely critical. We need much more resilient supply chains. We need to be able to locally source we need to support a combination of large commercial companies at scale, as well as small medium enterprises that make 80% of the local food supply chain. So that, that, that combination is absolutely critical. Uh, as development finance institutions, taking risk is extremely difficult as with commercial banks. And therefore we've really seen a very slow onset of agriculture and agribusiness. What is interesting today is that the companies that we thought were risky 10 years ago have proven over time that for 10 years we have been working with farmers. Pre-harvest financing will absolutely always be difficult, but there are different financial products today. So we need a combination of interesting financial structuring. Number two, we need a good, strong infrastructure connect connectivity, logistic investments, which will connect the continent to the markets that are on the continent. We need to produce for those markets. And fourthly, we need uh, blended finance instruments. And I think more than ever, uh, we hope that, you know, uh, the members of the Asia Society will see that Africa is a business opportunity. There are, and 
a lot of businesses that have proven themselves. And therefore, we hope that we can actually create much more momentum around the innovations that are happening on the African continent. Uh, with that, let me thank you. No, I mean, yeah, that's exactly, I think you you, you beautifully wrapped up. And I think uh, the, the key idea that I take out is, of course, one is uh, how do we do very innovative financing, agri, agri financing, uh, you know, agri fintechs and all, the role of agri tech, the role of public private partnership and players, uh, you know, localized trade, very important aspect of developing agriculture ecosystem in terms of logistics, supply chain, how do we integrate with the world because it helps Africa export its food products, but at the same time, decouple at a time when such pandemics and geopolitics uh, come to play. I think um, this is exactly what we wanted. I'm really sorry we have we are spot on in, in one hour, so I think um, many of you have to leave, but uh, very many questions I'm seeing, but I'm sorry I could not take more than the questions that I could in the given short span, but I think as what all of us said, I think we have to continue this debate further uh, and let's see in coming few months and uh, you know, time that how do we Asia society can further upend this debate um, to help at least on the multilateral forums like that to have more engaged discussion uh, uh, over these issues. So with that, I'd like to wrap up and thank you, Ms. Toda, thank you, Doga, thank you, Tatika and Aaron uh, for this lovely conversation. I think this is pretty engaged, very, very interesting, a lot of questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Valerie and Raya for organizing this and having me here. It was a pleasure. I, in turn, learned a lot about the African context. So understudied, so under understood. And I think this is now the time to, to have more debates on that.